Hey, this is Jeff Pilson, and you're watching and listening for BassPlayersOnly.com, my favorite. Mine too. Feel the blood rushing through my veins, baby, don't stop because I'm ready to blow. Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. We're coming to you today on location from the Foreigner Band Tour Bus, backstage behind what, well, us old folks call it Pine Knob, but we're supposed to call it DTE, yes. uh, Energy Theater, or something like that. Clarkston, Michigan, with a very special guest today. He played with Dokken. He played with Dio. He played with, uh, was it, uh, MSG? And uh, aside from Dokken, the band, George Lynch. And he's been with Foreigner since about 2004. I'm talking about Jeff Pilson right here. Hey, Jeff. Hello, John, and hello, everybody. Now we all know... Not everything about you, but a lot about you. Uh, I wanted to give the folks a chance to learn more about you because you're obviously very ensconced in the rock bass milieu. I don't normally talk wow. like that. <laughs> Two huge words in one sentence. No, no, thank you. I appreciate that. That's a compliment. Thank let's, you. Uh, let's talk about what led up to all that en ensconcement. Well, you, you were originally from Illinois, and then you went out west, and it was Washington, and then I, L.A., and okay. tell us the story. Okay, I was I was born in Illinois. Um, I then moved to Wisconsin and lived there until, I mean, there's a couple other little moves in there, too, but because my dad worked for the railroad road so we moved around a lot but we uh we ended up in wisconsin did you travel by train from we illinois did. to wisconsin we, we did actually a lot we I did that once actually when I, I was nine years old i went to camp in wild rose I, wisconsin actually really yes. I, I went to camp at uh, camp gray in baraboo wisconsin but anyway um i uh um, yeah, we did travel a lot by train. In fact, we one time we went Milwaukee to Denver by train, which was interesting. Wow. Anyways, uh, when my father passed away, um, we ended up moving to the city of Milwaukee, and I lived in Milwaukee until I was 13 years old, moved out west to a small town called Longview, Washington, where I went to high school, junior high and high school. Uh, and that's actually where I started to play a lot because it was a small town. I was kind of not used to the whole Excuse pace. Excuse me, to play what? Bass you, guitar. Bass. Yeah, I started with bass guitar. I actually started yeah. with bass. Really? Um, well, I started with cello when yeah. I was in fifth grade. Uh, and then soon after that, I started playing uh, bass. I, I basically got asked on the schoolyard if I would play bass in a band. A band which never materialized, but I did take up bass and, hey, it worked. Um, anyways, and then we moved to, uh, uh, and then I went to school at the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, then I've been in California pretty much since 78, so there you go. Okay, well, what prompted the move to go from from uh, Seattle area down to California? Well, actually working with the gentleman that you contacted earlier, Mike Varney. Uh, he had a project called Rock Justice. Mr. Shrapnel. That's right, Shrapnel Records, and this was before he had Shrapnel Records. But uh, Mike, Mike had this project called Rock Justice, and um, I had been involved in the demos of it, and so when I got a deal with EMI, he offered me to come down and be on the record, and, and so I did. And that got me to California, and I was in the Bay Area until 83, and then I moved to L.A., where I joined Dokken, and there you go. There you go. Okay. Well, I wonder, I mean, there's a lot that you've done, but I wonder if we can just pick up on a, a couple highlights. Uh, Dokken, you mentioned, we can certainly talk about that. Uh, one thing I, I wanted to ask you about in particular is Dio. Mm -hmm. and playing with him. I remember having a conversation with Rudy Sarzo one time. Mm -hmm. I think it was in an interview I did with him. And he was talking about Ronnie James Dio. And I, I'll, I remember pretty much his exact words. He said, when he sang Man on the Silver Mountain, he truly was the man on the Silver Mountain. <laughs> so with that introduction, tell me about your experience playing in that group. Well, I mean, all, all positive. I mean, Ronnie was amazing. I mean, yes, he's he's you know, one of the most amazing voices ever, but he was an amazing musician. He's an amazing band leader. He would always know everything that was going on when when we toured, which which was, I mean, it was a big education for me. And it's, it even helps in things like this now when we're headlining. I, I, I recognize things that he was able to see that, and you learn from things like that. Well, what what um, kind of, what are you talking about? Oh, what like, kind? you know, if the lights are a little bit off. He, he knew everything. He knew where everything was supposed to be. He knew where every rigging point was. It was it was incredible, his knowledge. All, all the good and all the bad that comes with that. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, there was some bad things too. Um, but but he was he was great. And to top it off, he was a wonderful human being. Just a great friend, human being. There's not a day goes by that I don't miss him. 
What would you like people to know about him that they may not know? Because just from what they read or see on the web. Um, well, I mean, he had an incredible sense of humor. I, I don't know if people realize how, what a joker he was. I'm, I mean, one time he and Vinny, we had a, um, <clears throat> we had a light guy who sort of had an attitude. And uh, they went in one time. <laughs> when he wasn't in his room and they taped all his furniture to the ceiling <laughs> kind of the classical trick but they actually did it um he just had a wonderful sense of humor and his laugh i love his laugh his laugh i wish i could imitate his laugh because it was really it was a really heartfelt laugh and um i mean he was just a wonderful guy really great guy down to earth guy you know what he he owned a base that i got to hold one time at a nam show a few okay. years i have a picture of myself somewhere holding ronnie james dio's base shortly after he had passed away wow was it an ebo uh, no i, I know don't he used think to play so ebo's at one time but i'll have to look it up i don't remember hmm. um how did you get the gig with foreigner you've had that gig a long time i have well in 2001 i did a movie uh called rockstar right. and in that movie along with me was jason bonham coincidentally who's playing as we speak um well jason in 2004 started working with mick jones and you know he and i got along really well both musically and personally during the movie so uh when he and mick started working and he kind of convinced mick to revamp foreigner they gave me a call and been here ever since wow pretty awesome well was that like an audition kind of thing or was it uh when i think of audition i think a cattle call 400 guys out uh, out lined up outside sir studios and uh, it doesn't sound like it was that kind of thing no it wasn't actually it was an invitation guys guys and girls i'm sorry yeah men gentlemen and ladies sorry politically correct (laughs) um no it was actually an invitation to do a show we did a show together and um, so I came down and we just rehearsed the show for a few days and then Mick decided to revamp Foreigner so no there was never any audition process although I would have been happy to do that if that was necessary but um, no it all worked out quite well yeah. I'll say since 2004 yeah. well I, I'll find out soon enough but who's coming out to the show is it, is, is it old guys like me that remember Foreigner from when I was in high school or are they bringing their kids or all of the above everyone in between it, it's a little bit of all of the above I mean there's definitely the, the fans that have been there for a long time there's their kids and then there's a, there are some new people who are familiar with, through uh, of us familiar with us through things like Glee and American Idol and you know some of the movies we've been in and you know that kind of thing so um, I think it's mostly the older people but there are definitely there is definitely a younger crowd there that have kind of found us on their own which is pretty cool Um, and then yeah like you say the children of the old guys like us (laughs) Uh, the uh Next question I wanted to ask you, I temporarily forgot, but, uh, oh, yeah, you, you obviously have been playing bass for Foreigner, and you've, you're on, I think, every album since, what, 2009, something like that, yeah. but you've also done some, five, so, five. Okay. <laughs> well, I read it on the internet, so you know it's yeah. true, there you go. Uh, but you've done some producing as well, yes. how, did, how did that come to be? It's something I've always been interested in, it's, uh, it's just, it's a passion of mine, I love the recording studio, um, I have... A wonderful studio attached to my house that that really um, has enabled me to produce a lot of projects and come up with a lot of records and it's just something I love to do um, you know I did uh, I had been doing a lot of the foreigner live work over the last several years and um, so that's a great opportunity great opportunity to work with some great people and I've gotten to do a couple of studio recordings as well which is really great um, and then I've gotten to work with a lot of great bands, which is which is wonderful. You know, did we D- Doc and did reform recently for a tour of Japan, and we did do a uh, a new song for the live record, and we did it in the studio, and I got to work with that, which was wonderful, and produce that. Um, and then I have projects coming up with uh, George Lynch and Mick Brown and I f- from Doc and along with Robert Mason from Warren to have a project. Won't be coming out till sometime in 2019, but that's looking amazing and that record's done and that's great. So getting to produce things like that have been really fun for me. A great, a great amount of um, creative satisfaction. And you know, that, 
that desire to be in the studio that you don't get as much because we tour year round. And you know, it's not like the old days where you take a few months off, record a record, and then go on the road. Now we tour all the time, and I just try and sandwich in records as, as much as I can because I love to make them. You know, I'm doing one with Last in Line, which is uh, the old Dio band now with a different singer by the name of Andrew Freeman, who's amazing. And, uh, and you know, getting to do things like that kind of helped my creative itch, but uh, uh, it's different than it used to be. You know, it, it really is. Oh, yeah. It's a different business do it pretty much uh, with, with a laptop and uh. yeah well as a lot of people do I mean I'm fortunate I have a drum room so I can record real drums and and guitar amps and all that kind of stuff like a like a real studio uh, I didn't mean to oversimplify it but no 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 but, but it has changed as you it, said. it has changed and, and the thing is I do actually carry with me a studio that you could make records on I mean I have you know I mean I do have my laptop and but I have, you know, decent speakers and, you know, but you can record guitars in a hotel. I did the, on the 2009 Foreigner re- recording you're talking about, I did the, the, the bass in hotel rooms, you know, on my laptop. So there you go. What about after that stuff that you mentioned? What, what about the future? You've had some steady gigs for, uh, you know, the better part of 30 plus years. Yeah. What, what about after that? Is there something else that you've always wanted to do that you just haven't gotten around to yet i haven't gotten around to writing the greatest song of all time yet i'm gonna i'm working on that one okay well, <laughs> be sure to let us know and we'll share it with these people here. wouldn't that be nice yeah. i mean yeah. yes i mean uh any kind of writing any kind of producing uh is something i would like to continue doing when my touring days are done um i can't see me ever not doing music i just can't uh so so you're stuck with me in music for a while but um We'll see. I mean, hopefully the touring thing can last for a few more years and and then uh, then, yeah, go into serious writing, producing. You know, I, I saw Paul McCartney interviewed by, by Larry King. So, you know, it was a few years ago and he says, what are your motivations? I mean, they can't be financial. He says, no. He says, why do you keep doing it? He says, because you're still trying to write that perfect song. So if exactly. Paul McCartney feels yeah, that yeah. way, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he's come pretty damn close. So uh, <laughs> it, it really is. I mean, it's who you are, you know. I mean, Mick Jones doesn't have to be doing this, but he's out here doing it every night because he loves it. Yeah. And as he says, what else would he do? This yeah. is what he's done all his life. Um, this is who we are. We're musicians, and f- musicians have to play. You know, that's that's what we do. Does Paul McCartney need to tour? Does Meryl yeah. Streep need to do another movie? Does John no. Grisham need to write no. another book? They do it because that's what they do, like you say. And isn't that great? Yes, it because is. then it's for passion, there and that's how it should be. Tell me a little bit about your gear. Well, um, I right now my main bass for Foreigner Live is a 73P bass that I had 66 p- pickups put in. Uh, just 66 I, pickups how many yeah. knobs are on the thing <laughs> uh, well I just I like the I like the 1960s bass picks I mean I'd love to put a set of 59 pickups in there but uh, that would be hard that I I do have some 59s on other bases, but I wouldn't tour with those. Uh, but the 66 pickups work great. What, f- uh, fender pickups, though, right? They're, they're Fender. Yeah. They were uh, 66P bass pickups, yep. Um, so that's my main bass. My, ma- my backup is a 71 that has also has 66 pickups in it. Um, and uh, so those are my main uh, bases for, for Fender Live, uh, for Foreigner Live. Um, I play through SVTs. Uh, uh, it's a model called the VR that came out. Seven, uh, not, I'm sorry. Uh, a, oh, now I'm spacing out. It's, Ampeg. It's an Ampeg SVT. It's not VR because I, I love those too, by the way. But um, but it's it's a special model that they came out with a few years ago, and AV I think is what it is. And uh, they only made a few hundred of them, but I happen to grab four of them, so I have two for my West Coast set and two my, for my East Coast set of, of gear, and um, I love those, uh, and that that's just the sound I need. I mean, you know, in the studio, I have a lot of old P basses, and I have plenty of other basses, so I have plenty of basses to pick from in the studio. Uh, and I also have an S, a 71 SVT in my studio that's the best-sounding SVT in the world, wow. I say, without any hesitation. Um, but uh, for Foreigner, I use the, the 70s uh, P basses. Yeah. Okay, and strings? Blue Steel. Blue, Dean Markley Blue Steel strings, man. Been doing that for 26 years now. Wow. Yeah, love them. Any effects or just? No, not not live. I I, I like the act, the sound of the bass going straight into the amp. I actually really hear a difference when there's something in in between. And there's something about a precision bass going into an SVT 
the the more raw the better for me and sure. that's part of what I'm going for is the that angry kind of sound and, and when I put stuff in between it I just I hear it, it tempers it somehow and I don't like it what about your technique and the balance between playing with your fingers playing with the pick do you do more of one than the other or I do mostly pick because it, it's mostly rock rock stuff where I prefer a pick but there are a few songs where I play with the fingers and I love I love it when I do because I love to play with my fingers I don't get to do it as no, as much as I'd like uh, but certainly on the ballads I do and it's a lot of fun for me so um, if we if I had my choice purely on a playing level I'd, I'd probably go half and half but I think the pick works for more of the songs live so that's why I do that all right your comment notwithstanding about I can't imagine doing anything you know not being in music yeah. My uh, kind of trademark signature sign-off question: What would you be if you weren't a bass player? And you can't say a cello player or a producer. I mean, something outside of music. I'd be a yoga teacher. Really? Mm-hmm. Simple, huh? Well, <laughs> well namaste. <laughs> namaste. Thank you. Om Shante. <laughs> On Shante. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, Jeff, this has been great. Thank you so much for pleasure. spending a few minutes with us My and pleasure. sharing your life and your ensconcement into the rock and roll milieu with the wow. uh, assembled multitudes. Wow. Uh, seriously, <laughs> much luck and continued success you. to you. Always keep us posted on I, I certainly will, anything man. Thanks. and everything great, that you're great doing. Great site. I'm glad, you, glad your site's up there and running. It's well, great. Thank you very much. All with right. our special friend, Jeff Pilson. Backstage in somewhere in Clarkston, Michigan. That's right. At the old Pine Knob DTE Music Theater. I'm John Liebman. You're watching for bassplayersonly.com. Uh-huh.